going to ask you to see this evening to open in your Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. And we won't stay there very long as we study this evening, but that is at least going to be our beginning place. In our study tonight, I, I, want us to, I want us to talk some about authority. And as I say that, I, I get that there are, there are many people in our world who look at a subject like that and think to themselves, why, why would we want to talk about something like that? You know, that's kind of boring. Uh, isn't there something more practical that we could talk about? Others may look at that and think to themselves, just off the top of their heads, what, is that, what does that even mean? What does it have to do with anything? Why do we need to talk about authority in connection with being a Christian and our service to God? In order to set the stage for understanding the importance of recognizing God's authority as we endeavor to serve him, I want us to look at something that is said here in Isaiah 52 and verse 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This verse, which actually the Apostle Paul quotes in Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, or at least part of it, contains one of the key messages of the gospel, the good news. That message is, God reigns. I don't know how many times, if, how, how often people think of that in connection with the good news, but it's part of it. God is king. He is sovereign. And the truth is that it is only through the exercise of his sovereignty that, that we are saved. And of all people, we ought to respect the sovereignty of God because we recognize just exact, exactly what he's accomplished. That's why authority matters it is because God is king and we'd like to be part of the salvation that he provides. And because of that, we listen to him. You know, when we talk about authority, we need to recognize that it's, it's grounded on four pillars, basically. First of all, God is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just open up your Bible and start reading at the beginning, and that's what it says. And as the creator, he has the right to tell us what to do. He has the right to tell us how to live. Second, Jesus Christ is the one who now reigns as king. That, that reign of God is now in, within the person of Jesus. And that was the message of the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 29 beginning, David, or, uh, uh, Peter starts talking about David. And he says, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. God made him both Lord and Christ, Peter would go on to say. And so when you look at that, he, he, he sits on his throne and he rules his kingdom. That's the point that Peter was making on the day of Pentecost. He was calling upon the people to recognize the, the kingship of Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul would say that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy, one translation says. He's at the top. And so you have that. And then third, the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the mind of God. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul would talk a little bit about how God would go about revealing his will to mankind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 9, he would talk about what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. It hadn't come into our mind. We haven't thought those thoughts. But then in verse 10, he says, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? And so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, he says. We can't figure that out. 
It's not something that we can just think about for a little bit and come up and understand what it is that, that God has in mind. The only way to know what God thinks is for him to reveal his mind to us. And that's what Peter said, uh, or that's what, uh, that's what Paul said God did through the Holy Spirit. He has revealed the mind of God. The fourth principle, mankind is God's creation, but is not in a position to be the authority. Do you remember in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, I know, O Lord, Jeremiah says, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. We as people are flawed sinners. We can't be the final standard of truth. We need God, the God who reigns. I want you to think for a moment about what Jude would say in the short letter that he penned as he, 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 what he said concerning those who had left the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, as he says in verse 3. A little bit later, he'll say in verse 11, Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of, 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 the gain, of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. And if you're just kind of quickly reading through that, you just kind of go past and you don't really pay attention to what, what is being said. But what does that mean? What do those three situations have in common? When you look at all three of them, at, at, at the heart of it, all, all of them have an attitude that allows people to think that their way is better than God's way, that their thoughts are higher than God's thoughts, thoughts that their needs outweigh what God knows and what God has planned for and what God has revealed. These all paid the price for a spirit of rebellion against the authority of God. When it comes to Cain, the way of Cain is a path to envy and hatred that is due to a failure to follow God's instructions by faith. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, God had said to Cain, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, send us crouching at the door. At the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And the truth is... He chose not to do well. Instead of ruling over sin, he gave in to it. The error of Balaam seeks to place worldly value and personal gain above God's will. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 3, as Moses was giving instructions about the time when the Israelites would come into the land of Canaan, he would say to them in verse 3, No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. They hired him. What that says, Balaam knew what was right, but he was greedy. He was looking for something else. The rebellion of Korah was an effort to, to question the plan and the order that God had set in place for leading his people. Korah and those who were with him would say in Numbers chapter 16 and verse 3 to, to Moses and Aaron, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? What were they saying in that situation? What was going on? In essence, here's what they were saying. We shouldn't have to listen to you, Moses. You should have to listen to us. You need to take our will into consideration here. We should be able to help call the shots. They weren't content with God's will as it was being revealed through Moses. They wanted to do things their own way. And they suffered as a result. You know, ultimately, all sin is rebellion against the nature and authority of God. The Apostle John would say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 that sin is lawlessness. It is breaking the law. And when we, when we sin, we, we fall short of the glory of God, Paul would say in Romans 3 and verse 23. That's been the way, it, it, that's how it's been since the beginning. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it was because they distrusted God's authority and they favored their own. Isn't that true? We want to look at this the way that we want to look at this. They were listening to the wrong authority. Do we really need authority, though? I mean, is, is that something that, I mean, in our worship, and our service to God, was that a thing of the past that only people in times past got in trouble for? Do we need God's permission to act on his behalf? Must we know that God approves of the things that we are doing? The answer to these questions may seem obvious to those who are gathered this evening, but but rebellion against the concept of authority is an old problem. 
History is filled, for example, with revolutions and rebellions against what is perceived as bad authority. People rebel because they think there is a better path to follow than the one that has been laid out before them. Isn't that true? Not just talking about religion there. And although many people fail to recognize this, the subject of authority is something that is fundamental. It always has been. In fact, one of the most fundamental issues that we will ever face is this very question. Why is it at the heart of the most basic questions about things like doctrine and practice? What are we going to believe and what are we going to do? It's at the core of recognizing truth from error. In fact, it, it has to do with the very source of truth itself. Where is that found? Where do we go? You know, it's not terribly surprising that many of the divisions that have occurred throughout history have occurred because of issues that pertain to authority. It's just interesting how that's taken place. And in some sense, it is a, it is a point of continual contention. And that's why we need to constantly reaffirm our faith and our trust in God and His authority and teach those principles to the next generation. I'll just go and tell you, there is no question in my mind whatsoever that the next generation is going to face issues that have to do with authority. And there's a reason for that. There's never been one before that hasn't. And so those things will come along again. And, and when we look at history, the, the deepest divisions were often those that occurred as a result of disagreements about this very question, about authority. The question of authority is one that will never go away. And when people act as though it is something that is unimportant, I'll just go ahead and tell you what happens. Bad things happen, always have. And that's why we need to equip people to, to handle these issues when they come. You know, there's no getting around the fact that everyone follows someone's authority. In the absence of God's authority, we will either make our own or we'll follow that of someone else. If we care, though, about God's will, then I'll tell you what we are going to do. We will seek to minimize our own. Because the truth is, we, we have no authority that comes from ourselves. We need to be like Jesus when in the garden in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42 would say to God, not my will but yours be done. That's the attitude that we are called upon to have. And it is the only justifiable response to the sovereignty of God. You know, we know that, that we can't be righteous in ourselves. We get that. We, we can't, uh, we can't uh, you know, establish our own righteousness. As the scriptures say in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, none is righteous, no, not one. And if that's true, and scriptures affirm that it is, then doesn't it follow that we also can't be authoritative in ourselves about matters that pertain to righteousness? I mean, I think that just follows. Seeking to establish our own authority really is ultimately no different in principle from seeking to establish our own righteousness. In truth, we are completely dependent upon God for both our salvation and for our authority, for what we are going to do. We don't have what it takes within ourselves. When I looked at the, at the word authority in the dictionary, this is the first definition that it gave. It is the power or the right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. And that kind of thing, you know, it's not just talking religiously when, when it's uh, given that definition. That kind of thing is often based on a, a position that is held. For example, a police officer has authority to enforce the law in a special way because of the position that he holds. A judge has the right to pronounce judgments that are consistent with the law because of the position that is held. And this is the, the, the power people have because they function in a particular role. But ultimately, God alone has that power or that right in the ultimate sense. And the authority that he possesses is based on his position. It is his position as the creator of all things. As we saw earlier, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything else, and I mean that in the ultimate sense, everything else stems from that fact. But when you look at that word in the dictionary, it's also used in another sense. It's defined in this way as well. Authority is the right to act in a specified way, delegated from one person to another. Or, it just simplifies it a little bit, it's official permission. You've been given permission to do something. In this sense, again, not just religiously, we might think of having a license to act because we've been given that power by a greater authority. 
We might have a license to drive that has been granted to us, or you may have permission to enter into a secured facility of some kind based on, on that, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you've got a license to practice medicine, what, whatever it might be. In cases like these, we're, you know, you know, we're not the final authority. We've been given permission by someone to do something. And, and when we talk about having authority to do something as God's people, we're claiming that we have his permission to do it. For example, when we talk about the authority to, to eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, what we're saying is that God has given us permission to do that. Now, I get that he's actually, he has commanded us to do that. And as I said a moment ago, authority is the power or the right to give orders or make decisions or enforce obedience. How, how we come to understand what we're authorized to do as God's people, it's really an important study in its own right. And we may talk about that more in the weeks to come. But we have to begin with the recognition that the ultimate source of authority is God. He determines the boundaries of permission. We don't decide that. And it's only when he has permitted or when he has authorized something that we can say, we have authority to do this. That's an important principle. It's one that not everyone in the religious world today recognizes. You know, because of who God is. Again, because he is the creator of all things. Any understanding of authority has to flow from him. It has to come from his nature. He alone has the absolute right to rule, the right to govern, the right to command, the right to expect obedience, and really all other authority is delegated by him. And you see that in the scriptures. Take a minute to go to Romans chapter 13, if you will. That's true in the realm of government, for example. Romans 13 and verse 1, Paul says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Again, ultimately says it goes back to God. That's also true in the home. You know, among other things, Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He would go on to say to, to fathers in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The Lord is behind all of that. And of course, it's also true when it comes to the church, isn't it? There's no person or group of people who has inherent authority in the ultimate sense. There's nobody who, with whom the buck stops, who, who has flesh and blood and walks upon the earth now. They only have it in that they've been given permission by God to act in whatever capacity they serve. In some sense, you can even say, I think, the same thing about Jesus to a degree. I realize that Jesus is God, and therefore what we've been talking about uh, concerning God this evening would apply to Christ as well in some ways. But have you noticed the, the kind of language that is used in the Bible when it talks about the authority of Jesus? In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, after Jesus had been raised from the dead and he gives the, the great commission to the apostles, he, he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth, and on earth has been given to me. It's been delegated. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, Paul would say there that God has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so when you look at that, even Christ submitted to the authority of God the Father. He would say in John chapter 5 and verse 30, I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's the attitude that we're to have. That same principle, of course, is at work in, in what Jesus taught and, and in also in the, the revealing of the word of God. For example, in John chapter 12 and verse 44, Jesus says there, he says, Whoever believes in me believes not in me but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, Jesus said. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. That's Jesus talking there. In chapter 16 of John, 
few chapters later, Jesus is teaching the apostles here, and he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. So when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Even there. That's where we get our authority. That's where we get our license to act. If we can't trace it back to God through Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, then I'll just go and tell you this. We don't have it. We don't have the authority. The reason I wanted to talk about these things this evening is because we, we need to respect God's authority and because not everybody does. And as I look at things, it seems pretty clear to me that, that many people are not terribly concerned about the things that we have talked about this evening. And a lot of them who are not are people who would claim very much to be Christians. But if God reigns, if he really is king, then I'll just tell you his kingship should be a fundamental part of our understanding about who he is and why authority is such an important topic. We need to recognize what lies at the heart of all sin. Sin is essentially displacing God's authority and, and, and substituting our own again or someone else's. So may we learn to take God and his will seriously in all that we do. And we read, or not me, but it was read before we began this, this evening, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, where Paul says, whatever you do, not sometimes, not on occasion, but all the time, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's being a disciple. That's being in the place that God put us to be in. That's recognizing that God reigns. And I'll tell you what, the fact that he reigns, that's good news. Because there's nobody else who's qualified. We're going to probably talk about some things, maybe not every week as we go for the next few weeks, but maybe a lesson here and a lesson there where we're going to talk about some of these things that pertain to authority because they are important. And there is a whole lot that we haven't talked about tonight. But as we bring things to a close this evening, we want to uh, give the opportunity to anyone who maybe needs to obey the gospel. Maybe you have some aspect of your life that's not in keeping with God, with what God has revealed. And you know that God and his way, his way is best. Maybe you haven't been doing it. So why not just allow him to take control? Why not look to what he says and put that into practice? God reigns, but why not let God reign in your life? Choose to allow him to be king. Let him set the terms. Let him tell you what to do because his ways are best. That's the good news. So if you're here this evening and we can help you in some way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing to encourage you.